Brad's going to read a story for us and then our scripture because you know what time it is. First Sunday of Advent, oh. <laughs> Christmas is coming. Put your ear to the ground, have someone step on it, and you'll hear it coming down the road like this. But it'll be here and it'll be gone before you know it. And this, <laughs> I saw a meme the other day, the guy said, son, to grandpa talking to his grandkids. We, we had, it's so good in the old days, we used to actually throw toilet paper back at the trees. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, now that's funny. So anyway, let's pray and get started today. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your blessing upon us and the tie that binds us together. We pray as we examine this today that our hearts would once again be bound together, that we would be able to experience your love and through your spirit uh, be joined and joined together. Father, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And then uh, I'm going to have Adam. Do uh, you want to do the scripture first or do you want to do the story? Okay. Here's our, here's our guest speaker, the man <laughs> with the great haircut. Yay! <laughs> Woo! Does that look good? Oh, yeah. It's what's highlighted. Praise only in the Revelation. In the Donald Thompson Giant Print Bible, Adam, it's what's highlighted. <laughs> he has so much stuff highlighted from different sermons over the years. Pretty soon all of it's going to be highlighted. So bless be the tie that binds. John Fawcett. Bless be the tie that binds our hearts in Christian love. The fellowship of kindred minds is just to that above. John Fawcett who lived from 1739 to 1817, was a dissenting Baptist clergyman in England. And he gave us one of the most beloved farewell hymns of all times. Fawcett's parish in Waynesgate, described by hymnologist Albert Bailey as a struggling group of houses on top of a barren hill, may not have been typical for many rural pastors in the 18th century. Fawcett, who was orphaned at 12, was bound out to a tailor at Bradford where he works long hours. He learned to read and eventually mastered Pilgrim's Progress, a devotional classic by John Bunyan. Fawcett was converted <laughs> under the powerful preaching of George Whitfield while the evangelist delivered a message to 20,000 people in an open field. It was said that upon telling Whitfield he wanted to preach, the evangelist gave Fawcett his blessing. Mr. Bailey describes Fawcett congregation at Wayne's Gate. The people were all farmers and shepherds, poor as Job's turkey, an uncouth lot whose speech one could hardly understand, unable to read or write, most of them pagans cursed with vice and ignorance and wild tempers. The established church had never touched them. Only the humble Baptist had sent in an itinerant preacher there, and he had made a good beginning. John and Mary Fawcett went to live there in 1765 following his ordination. By engaging families house to house, he built a congregation that grew to the point that a gallery had to be added to the modest meeting house. With the addition of four children to his family, a modest salary that was supplemented by parishioners' donations of wool and potatoes, which was barely adequate, especially during the long winters. The story is told that a prodigious parish with more financial resources in London, Carter Lane's Baptist Church, extended a call. It was at this point it becomes difficult to separate fact from apocryphal imagination. Mr. Bailey, who was a vivid storyteller, sets the scene. John and Mary decided to accept. The announcement was made to the church, and the farewell sermon was preached. The bulky items of his furniture and some of his older books were sold, and for the day of departure arrived. The two-wheeled cart came for the rest of his belongings, and likewise came the parishioners to say goodbye. The crowd was despondent and in tears. According to Mr. Bailey, Mary is quoted as saying, I can't stand it, John. I know not how to go. John responded, Lord help me, Mary, nor can I stand it. We will unload this wagon. And to the crowd he said, We've changed our minds, we're going to stay. Mr. Bailey describes a scene of pandemonium as the crowd broke out in joyful acclamations. We do know that John Fawcett remained in Waynesgate for 54 years and nearby Hebden Red Bridge. We do not know if the hymn he wrote was written in conjunction with his decision to remain in Waynesgate, but its language connects well with the congregation, identifying with the struggles for life and our unity in Christ. 
So now we're going to be on Luke chapter 2. Let me let you there. A lot back when we had So Luke chapter 2. And I'll have you stand when we're all ready to read. I had to ask Dad how long he wanted me to go because I was like, I could just keep going. Pretty soon we're in March. That's where I want to start Genesis also. Every Sunday. Luke chapter 2. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This is the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone went down to his town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in clothes and placed him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Christ, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. When the angel had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let us go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off, and they found Mary and Joseph and their baby, who was lying in the manger. And when they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told to them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told Heavenly Father, we just pray that you'll take us into this Advent season and that we'll be ever mindful of your Spirit as we move together and as we allow your Spirit to unite us, guide us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. You won't have to get up for another two hours. <laughs> That's a cute thing. <laughs> Why don't we talk about the tie that binds, and I, and I just... Uh, didn't start out doing my sermon this way, but as the Lord led me along this week, I first of all, the concept that I started with is the fact that I, I wholly believe that the Bible from in the beginning, to so don't change a word in this, is a call to an inner relationship with God that ties us and binds us in holiness. Holiness as in a whole relationship with God. And, and I was thinking earlier this morning when I got up, heard some brackets on the TV that wasn't really Christmas music. It was something else. But to understand that in the beginning, Adam woke up and said, Hello, God. Eve woke up and said, Hello, God. And ever since then, We've been born screaming and hollering and not really understanding what's going on. How far have we fallen from God's love and God's grace and God's unity? And then we spend a lifetime coming to know Him again. So far off, coming to know Him again. Certainly not sinful by nature, but certainly not knowing what it is to know all of God. And to, all, to know all of God is to love Him. Because the relationship would be there. It was always supposed to be his arm around our backs, walking through the garden, going, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? And, and how uh, attentive it is. Um, <laughs> we got a 95-pound Airedale that comes and puts his face right here when he wants something. And if you don't understand what he wants, you're going to be miserable until you figure it out. You're going to have to give him the food. Usually it's food, so that's easy. Or pets. Uh, the water, huh? Or pets. 
or yeah. if somebody wants a tantrum. Yeah, yeah, or just to, to, to fight you or wrestle you. But to understand that man was not good to be alone was something that God saw from his creation. It's like, you'd work better if you had some help because there's some things you don't know. And, and maybe Adam was the first man that didn't know everything I don't know. So he made woman and it completed man. And as time went on, um, man has, we've seen several heroes through the Bible and we've seen even Jesus. And I started in John 17 because that's where Jesus prays for you and him to be one. Prays for his disciples to be one. And so down through scriptures, even this crazy Moses guy, even this crazy Noah guy, this Jonah guy, all of those are God's way to try to lead us back to that beginning relationship where we open up our eyes and say, Hi God, let's go. It isn't such pomp and ceremony. It's everyday living that he wants to be a part of your life so that you can and he can walk together again. And we're experiencing the oneness, the academic perfection, if you want to use the word, to be one and bound. Um, I, I understand this story that Adam read to us. Did you, did you see the... The, the, the irony in the thing is that he goes to a big uh, revival meeting and he finds the Lord and immediately he feels the call of God on his life and he goes up to the evangelist and goes, man, I just don't know what I'm going to do. I just feel like I need to go and share this good news. And, and he, what does the evangelist say? Well, you ain't got enough education. Well, you ain't bound in the right place. Or just keep it down because there's other people to do that. No, he said... God bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you and go and do what the Lord asks you to do. And he, he is uh, not of the Nazarene last name, so he didn't go to the right school. And so they gave him a winner of a church. <laughs> they go, there's a field out there with some people in it, and it's a ministry opportunity. That's a big one you want to look out for. We got an opportunity for you. <laughs> you know, we Angus and I are pro by vocational pastors. We're we're really pro. You know, the corporate model is to get your degree, get to the church, build the numbers up, and then move to a bigger one. That's the that's the United States model. The biblical model is people listening to God and going where He calls them, and watch the fruit, and watch the fruit. And so, of course, Mr. Orphan from nowhere gets the hillside with, and did you see what, what did they say some of those were, Adam? They couldn't speak well. They're the new <laughs> rejects, the, 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 the orphans of society. Yeah, just go and see if you can make it. I remember this, and I'll always say this because I know it's true. There were people on the Oregon Pacific District that had bets on whether I would last at Parkdale more than a year. And after I lasted more than a year, they took bets that I wouldn't be there in two years. And they kept losing money on me. And so five, we were there five years. Five years. Could have been there longer, but you needed us. Actually, Angus needed us. I think we only were there because eight little ladies prayed us there. It wasn't my fault. I just was, God, what? Go down there. I don't know why. We did 15 funerals in the first year and a half. Not all, some board members, some not. But to know that we were where God wanted us to be was really liberating because it couldn't get any worse. We rebuilt the whole facility. We got there and the church was just in, in turmoil because the ex-pastor's daughter had 15 jobs in the church. And I sat down with her and I said, I would wish you had two. They do them really well. And everything else, oh, I am going to get take you through this leadership course, aren't I? I wish you had two and everything else not be done. Angus would tell you, and I was hoping he was here because we all have the knowledge of ministers that come into a church and they guilt you into serving Jesus. They make you feel guilty to give. They make you feel guilty to do what God asks you to do. They throw a bunch of rules on you and expect you to keep them. And when you feel bad about it, then they grab you. I 
I never felt led to do that. And so I told our people, we're not going to do anything because you got a leaky roof, and if we don't fix the leaky roof, there's no point in having a church here. So y'all can argue about what you want to argue about. We're going to fix the roof first. And during that time, people understood that I feel that if something's not on you, that is the Holy Spirit asking you to do that which is in front of you. And it's hard, guys. It's really hard. I know I did youth camps, and I had been a uh, counselor in youth camps for years, and then I started running them. <coughs> and I saw the youth camps that had 20, a booklet of all the rules of camp. Everything that you would and would not do. Well, Tim, I don't know about you, but that's just the throwing down the gauntlet, you know? Because I'm either going to find a loophole to do what I want to do, or I'm going to break this and you're not going to know I broke it. I mean, there's the rules. Now, I'm sorry I'm not the subservient first child that does what everybody wants them to do, but I'm just saying, I've got to know this works. Or it ain't going, I'm not going to play this game if those rules aren't real. And so after a lot of prayer and experimentation, we started doing the Union Gospel Mission Camps. And I would bring the kids in and I'd go, you know, we love you kids. And we wish that you would only do the things that you know God would want you to do. There's a couple of guidelines, but other than that, be respectful to one another. Be respectful to the camp that you've been given to be in. I had less trouble with those kids than the kids that we had. I was always disciplined before. I was always sending somebody to their cabin. Always, and this, every once in a while, yeah, you'd have a kid that went outside the boundaries. But when you sat down with them and said, really, we're here and God is here. Do you really want to do this? Is that how you want to go? And the terrible fact that they knew that I would go home and talk to their parents about whatever problem they had went a long ways. You group too. If they knew I was going to go to their school and sit down in their class with them and see if they were a problem at school, oh my goodness, a lot of kids got religion really fast. And so church-wise, if there's something, and some people don't get this, some of our congregations need to be poked with a sharp stick to get them to do what God wants them to do, and God forgive us, because we're probably going to poke you the wrong way. But I really believe if you're a body of believers that listens to the Holy Spirit and you're irritated, gotten angry about, or just discomforted about something, pray about it because God is trying to move you and work with you. I always learned early that one of the voices in my head was me. The other one was God. And usually the other voice that I would ever feel or influence I would feel wasn't God. If it wasn't me and it wasn't God, don't be led that way. And so, one Sunday, I'll never forget, we are in that little church down there in Oregon, and I had, I said, how many of you people would like to teach a class of kids? Would you just line up along the front here? You remember that Sunday, from here to here, with no gap, people came up to say, I want to share the good news with the kids. I didn't have enough kids for them all to share. That was the bad, that wasn't a too bad thing. There was really good because the school would bring the kids on the buses to the school and every Friday they'd get to come across the street to my church and we could have during school two hours of education. Two hours of vacation, Bible school basically. It was a miracle that took place but it was because we felt this, com com we were compelled to share the good news. And uh, that's the way this, I could just see when we left. How, what would you do? Here's a man who was ready to leave, and they knew that God wanted him to go on, sort of. At least the system said, you got more money, you got hey, you got it all. But the Holy Spirit checked them right at the last minute, and they took all the stuff off their cart. They had sold everything already. They just had the cart. And uh, they went back and ministered for 54 years. And we got that song. I, 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 said, I told Kathy this morning, I said, you know, I'm going to read this, and you're going to start singing it. It's out of all lights down. 
and we'll put a mic on you. Blessed be the tie that binds our hearts and Christians' love. The fellowship of kindred minds is like to that above. It's like that with God. It's like that with God. In the midst of life and adversity, you can form friendships or you can make enemies, but we endeavor in the body of Christ to develop that bond that's undeniable. Um, got a call from Phil last night. He has a place for a whole year now. Down there he's starting, he gets, he's going to get into his, his new apartment in December and he's got a year contract. And I said, I said that's great. That's great. Because you know what? And I, and I feel this. And I, and I know this is true and I told Julio this this morning. When you lose someone close to you, Wait a year, if you can, if it's possible. Wait a year before you make a major decision. Because you need time for the dust to settle. You need time to hear the Holy Spirit. Because your grief is going to drown him out. So take the time. And Phil took the time. Because I can understand that, can't you, where everything you see is Janice? I mean, I remodeled the kitchen for her. I did the yard for her. And I can see where that would be really hard to do. And, and, I, and I'll use Jane as an example. I talked to her about this one time. And she said, oh, no, it makes me just, I, feel, I, I really feel good living here because Danny made this house for me. And so it's up to the individual. But I would just, I would just ask you to cool your heels when someone passes away, your mate or someone in your family. Just don't, just don't need your... Let God lead you where he needs And if you need to leave, go. If you need to go. Kathy's grandma went to uh, California and lived with her son for six months. Kathy moved in there, saved money on rent, and then we got married with that money, and the rest is history. And she came home and said, I can't live here anymore. And she sold the house and went into another place. And I guess it is part of this story because it's our hearts bound together, how we help one another get through the situations of life. And uh, it's good to see Phil is down there and he sounds like he's thriving. He has to get a new tire on his Harley, though. He had a, it, was flat, it was low on tread and it had a wire sticking in it, Steve. And he, said, he said they wouldn't patch it, so I had to buy a new tire. So his Harley's getting a new tire, but it's one of those. And, you know, when we look at life and as we go through life with God, God is still more concerned with what's happening through you than what's happening to you. A lot is happening all around you, but you know, God is still mostly focused on what's, how are you going to handle it? How are you going to do it? The story that Adam read is talking about the shepherds, and I, I can't help but get stuck on the sheep because I grew up around sheep. I, I, I would... I was too small to get over the four-foot fence, and I would climb up the sides of it, kick my leg over the top, and fall into the ground. And I learned a lot from those sheep. These shepherds all learned those same things together, and I'm sure they would come back and go, Did you know when that old you and I get close to her baby, she stomps her foot on the ground? And the other guy goes, Well, yeah, but you know when she stomps it the fourth time, she's going to headbutt you. <laughs> I know this is true. <laughs> the smell of sheep. You ever smelled sheep? The smell of sheep. Not like goats. Not like dogs. Thank you, Jesus. Not like cats. <laughs> <laughs> but to see those sheep, and, and I can only imagine in the wintertime, I remember going out to the pen, the sheep corral, and getting in the middle of them because they're all huddled together because it's cold. But guess what? They come with wool sweaters. They come with wool sweaters, and you get right in the middle of them, and like, except your feet aren't warm. But anyway, you can be right in the middle with those sheep, and they pack around you like that, and it's warm. They knew this together. Um, the shepherds also knew what it was like. You ever been camping or out in the woods, and you got a really nice fire going, and you're standing there, and you can see literally smoke coming off your outfit here. And you could just about determine there's ice on the backside of you. <laughs> so you turn around like this, and it starts to get hot back there, and your ice is forming on this side of you. Shepherds 
one of the things that bound them together was spending that time together and saying, hey, move your shoes from the fire, they're smoking. The ties that bind us together. We look into the night, and remember back in those days, before the angels came, they didn't go, look, there's a satellite. <laughs> when they looked into the stars, either it was a UFO or it was angels coming. And I want to tell you, they thought that the tie that binded them together was the fact that they actually saw the angels. I imagine that was an unreplaceable memory that was indelibled upon their memory. But when they went and saw that baby in the manger, they found the secret of our lives. They saw that baby, and Christ is what binds our hearts together. Binds our hearts together in a kind of love and a kind of peace and a kind of understanding. Um, you know, they probably at times said, what are we going to do? But after they met Jesus, they knew what they were going to do. They were going to go tell the world about him. Together, they were all surprised, yes. And it was an awesome sight. But when they went and saw the baby, their hearts knew. They knew that they knew that they knew, like the old timers used to say. How do you know you're saved? I know. Well, how do you? I just, I know. God saved them. <clears throat> you see the experience that the wise men went through that bound their hearts together. And, you know, different trips we've taken together. Um, working up in Spokane with John and Bud, they're gone. John's still here, but Bud's gone now. But we went up there and that was the most fun we had in a long time. We took a bunch of guys up and worked on a missionary project in Spokane. But our guitar player set a big gulp down on the floor of the church bus. And it has very good acceleration with a V10 in that church bus. And it spilled over. And I don't know if you know what kind of drinks that Bud used to get. They were this big and they were that big around. We pretty much stuck the we pretty much stuck the whole bus clear to the back window. The back door had Mountain Dew coming out of the back of it. Things that bind us together. In adversity, we find these things that bind us together. But the true thing, think about the wise men. They shared a bond that, that really only they can understand. And once they found Christ, that put the end of the, the period on the end of the sentence. They, they agreed with one another to take a crazy thing. You ever done a crazy thing with your buddies? Something that you wouldn't think of on your own? Or I was always the guy that had the idea that conned my buddies into doing it with me. Because why? We were friends. And so we would go do that and it had something to do with the police sometimes, but most of the time not because we tried to... It's, not, it's hard in life to be a young man and do things so you're just not breaking the law but still having a lot of fun. You know what I'm saying? Isn't that right? Tim, is, is it, is, there should be a book about that. These are the things that you can do and not go to prison for. Those are the fun things that your buddies do to you because you're bound together. Um, there are things in life that gnaw a person's soul worse than the fear of death. Things that you are compelled to do that regardless of... <laughs> Yeah, I'm thinking of marriage too. <laughs> Mr. I'm engaged. There are things that you do that you're compelled to do by an inner unction, an inner draw. And so if they would have stayed home, the wise men would have stayed off in the east and wondered about this star, wondered about the ancients' words about it signaling something special. Will we go and find it out or will we stay home? And they came to the meeting of together and finally said, I gotta go. And the guy next to him said, I gotta go too. I gotta go. Put everything on hold, run my business for me, load it up, we're heading, get in the truck, we're going. I remember we took eight guys in my little motor home over to go salmon fishing one time. It was one of them things that I wouldn't do it again. <laughs> We had Ed Bell laying on the floor sleeping. We had three guys up above. We had two guys on the side. We had eight people in a 
I don't know, maybe a six person sleeping thing? <clears throat> big people. Big, big people. You, you know what I'm saying? And we all, and I don't even know how the, the snoring that was going on, I don't even know how the siding stayed on the RV. It probably has loose screws after we got back. But these guys got together and said, okay, let's, let's head over there. Let's follow that star. That's not crazy. Let's follow that star because we have that inner unction. Traveling with their possessions over miles and miles and they developed a friendship with one another that, that only they could know. And so this band of dreamers comes and finds God. Because God is more concerned what's happening in you than into you. And when they saw him, that bond was sealed. And I'll bet when they left Jesus, their lives were never the same. Never the same. Dude, you thought you were crazy going up and accepting Christ. Man, you thought you were crazy for pursuing a life after Christ. And you see him because he's near you and he wants to be with you. And he wants you to wake up in the morning and go, hello, hello. We see the other experiences that bound people's hearts together. So much so, think about the family. Think about Mary and Joseph's arrival to Bethlehem. Here was a little girl that, it wasn't a new thing to know that a virgin would give birth to the baby Jesus, to the Savior. Not baby Jesus at that time, but the Redeemer would come through a young virgin. And so, here is this girl, not of a royal court, not in the right position, <laughs> didn't have the right education, didn't have the right last name, and yet she comes to her family and goes, I'm going to have the child of God. I'm telling you, it's not the first one in the history of the world who said that, because every Jewish girl prayed for that. Every family prayed for that. But this was the one who actually, it was true. And it actually took place. And immediately, I imagine some of them around the girl said, eh, no, no, no. It hasn't happened before. It, it isn't happening now, right? But we know from Scripture that some of the family said, praise God, a miracle has taken place in our midst. Isn't it something when we have miracles take place and we don't recognize they're miracles of God? Think about it. Has God done for you or been you been near a miracle and not seeing the hand of God in the midst of it? Some of them believed. And that, that, that little rascal baby in Elizabeth believed because he, what? Heard the voice. And then you think about that tie that how she faced rejection, and here is Joseph. Wow, how's this going to come off? Joseph could have been this dirty old man that had this little girl and got her pregnant. Don't say that ain't so. Did the preacher just say that? Yeah, it could have been. I know what you're thinking. It could have been. In that day and age, it could have been. And so... Certain people are looking down their nose at him, and he's going, man, God, what did you do to me now? Look at this mess I'm in. You ever done that, fellas? Look at this mess I'm in. How are we going to get through this? And the Holy Spirit comes to him and says, no, have faith. Have faith. And so he goes ahead and says, okay, and gets on that donkey and heads off. No reservations. Mary and Joseph faced adversity and I believe that it made them stronger as a couple. Because here they are. I accept what's going on. I don't understand it. I accept what you're going through. I don't understand it. And they went on. And don't you know that when that baby was born, their very purpose for life realized itself in that manger to know that truly it has been good to be used of God and to be part of his plan 
and to allow God to use us, the tie that binds them together. The love of God that ties them together, and as they raise that boy, that, that boy that knew everything, <laughs> and as he grew to be a man, they could look at one another and say, truly God is in this. Truly we, what a family. What a family. As they join the pattern, is, the pattern there for Christian marriage to know that truly God has joined these together. I think one of the things, I want to be careful because I don't know nothing about women. I just want you to know that ahead of time. But I just want you to know that one of the things that makes our marriage strong is the fact that God was there when we joined our lives together. That the Holy Spirit bound us together. And our lives were tied together because of that. I can face tomorrow. No matter what goes on in our marriage, I can face tomorrow because you know what? <laughs> Put this on my tombstone. It's your fault, God. <laughs> it's your fault. <laughs> if that's what happens, God, you joined us together. You know what we're going through. You know what our needs are. You can take us where we need to go because you ordained us when we were married. You bound us together. Two hearts joined together with the Holy Spirit in the control of their lives. And if I ever deviate from that, if I ever go far from that, I have that memory, I have that knowledge that the Holy Spirit was involved in that relationship. Not only did He find us out and bring us together, but we made that vow, we made it to God. And so, I don't care how hard she hits me, when my vision comes back, I'm still going to love her. And I only say that because you know sometimes I need hit. <laughs> That's just the way it is. Are they recording this? <laughs> Can we experience that tie that binds in our hearts and forge through adversity today? Absolutely. Absolutely. There can come a peace of mind in the midst of the storm. The world doesn't even know what joy to the world means. Have, can you get a handle on what real joy is? Can you get a handle of angels singing at the top of their voices on the side of a hill that flattens the crowd? Can you see this itinerant preacher going out there and telling the gospel to people who've never heard it in a language that they can understand? And there's a lot of times I'm sure he had to look at his congregation and go, I don't know what God does. Faith. Real joy, real love, the kind of love that says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And looks down on them and weeps. Strength that comes from God. Strength, the human strength. You realize, don't you, that the Holy Spirit not only comes and gives us wisdom, not only gives us knowledge and joy and peace and happiness, He gives us strength. And I believe that the human body has never tapped into all of the strength that God has allowed it to have. You, we've got all it's allowed, but I really believe physical strength comes from knowing the Holy Spirit too. I believe that strength comes from the utterance of the Holy Spirit to be in touch with every cell in your body so the little old lady on the bridge can pick up the car and pull the kid out from underneath. We've seen it. Have you seen freaky strength before? I believe the Holy Spirit gives strength to the weak. We know He brings healing. And in that realm, that didn't heal so and so, I want to tell you what, every Christian that's died is in a better place than they are right now. And every Christian that didn't die is here for a reason. For a reason. Every year another graduating class comes out of nursing school Every year there are young people who need to see God at the last moment and your preacher needs to see God at the last moment redeem his own and bring them to him and have it be well with my soul. Because that's what God does. He does those things. And we get Christmas now because it's not the world's holiday. There is a oneness and a unity that can only come through the hearts of believers. I thought about the standing outside there with you. <laughs> we got down to our church and we had a disagreement right off the bat. We backed our truck up to the door to unload 
and the board had a meeting, and one of the ladies on the board said, well, that salary was minus housing, which meant it was nothing. <laughs> it's like, we got a whole, I think we were really killing them. We got $1,000 a month. Isn't that amazing? Total. And housing. But the house would have rented for seven or 800 and she actually went to the board meeting and said, <laughs> hey, this isn't the deal. And my superintendent looked at her like, are you nuts? And uh, he, he said, you're not doing this to this young couple. You're going to be true to your word, board. This couple's coming to you. They're forsaken jobs that paid more than you're even thinking of giving them. And you're giving them an old house to live in. You're going to stick to your word. You're not going to change it. He told me that later. And I said, well, that's good, Mr. Banker, because... The truck was still loaded up to the door. I could have just shut the door and drove home because we still had a house there. And the person, that I want to warn you, the person that made the biggest problem, I did her funeral. Yeah. And I never fought with her once. I never did. You need to be careful about how you treat your clergy. Because guess what? We're doing what God asks us to do and get in and get involved. And the bonds that we have with the people, even her, her whole family, we led them to the Lord. Even, even on the board. Man, I had a board member that was a chronic alcoholic. And when he came to Jesus, his whole family got saved. His brother, the drunk, got saved. That's a whole other story. Because there's this thing about being in Christ that should be totally infectious, that should be totally winsome, that no matter how you come across or how people misinterpret you or how it works out, stay in Christ and let the tie that binds you together work it out. We're so different. We're so different. What do you think makes it all work in harmony? The Holy Spirit and the tie that binds. We can share this bond with the people around us. Um, you can call, and I can say, God bless you, Phil. I hope the Lord just uses you down there. And he can pray for you, and we can pray for each other. Even our young people that are gone from us, we have a bond with them, an ordained bond that reaches into the hearts of our people. But let's hope. Let's hope that through this season, through this Advent, those around us will come to know that relationship with Christ, that relationship that takes a burden away, that relationship that renews marriages, that relationship that renews children's and their, their faith in Christ. And let's be a part of that. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you today for all that you've shared with us, for all that... Um, I've looked, Lord, I've been all over the wall today, but I pray that one portion would fit into the tie that binds in our hearts in Christian love. Father, we thank you. We pray for those who are sick today. We know that there are those in our congregation who really need a touch from you physically. We pray for Jane, that you would just keep your hands on them. And God, for all of those who suffer from cancer, you know every cell and every body, every hair on every head or every lack of hair. We pray that you would just reach down and touch. And Father, we will be the first. Whoever this is will be the first to give you the glory. Because it's not any of us. It's not any freaky medicine. It's not any freaky treatment. God, you can touch our hearts and lives and bodies and make us new. You can redeem us from addictions. You can keep us focused on your will for our lives. Lord, help us to be excited as we Seek and find out and do your will. And Lord, we truly thank you that it hurts us not to be together as we have been. God, I pray for the future days when we'll be in those campouts with our kids. That we'll be going through the tunnels. That we'll be going through the caves. That we'll be doing vacation Bible school. That we'll be out in the gym to see it covered wall to wall with kids enjoying fellowship. Father, we know that some of the fellowship is not the keeping of 
X's and O's, but it's breaking bread together. It's doing things together. It's being where people are together in our church. And Father, I pray as we do that, we would swell around the community around us, that they too would say, man, I want to be a part of something like that. And guide us through this week. We pray your blessing upon Angus as he travels. Would you bring him home safely? Be with him and the kids and Maxine. We just pray your blessing now on all of those who are sick. We thank you for all those who don't get the disease. We pray that we would be ever wise and follow you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'm afraid that's I'm afraid I, I didn't use the full time. I said I would have been two hours and I didn't, I didn't do it. You got some more prayer requests? Yeah. Julio, are you, are you still having church after church? Yes. I, I tuned in uh, yes, last Sunday. Yeah. We have Michael O'Neill is missing. His wife passed away, and uh, we pray for, for Michael and Rosemary. Her boyfriend, Roger, lost uh, his best friend on Thanksgiving. And, uh, wow. Heavenly Father, we pray for these requests that have been brought forward through the Internet. We just pray that you would be with them in a time of comfort. And a comfort that makes the world freak out. Lord, an up and, up and just magnificent comfort. Father, we pray for your guidance now in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So that's Michael O'Neill and his best friend and then Rosemary. We need to pray for those two. And, and I want to tell you, the rest of you, you need prayer too. I know because I need prayer. We all need to remember to pray for one another. You don't have another organization that does this, man. They adjourn the meeting and you go home. We don't go home. We adjourn the meeting and we keep thinking and praying about the people that we're bound with. And and if you want us, you, I won't, no plagiarism, if you want to blame God for the relationships you've established here, because those people you know, just blame God. Say, God, I don't know, man, they're in my church. i got to pray for them. You can do that too. God bless you and keep you. May His face shine upon you. You may be dismissed. Amen. Well, Les Catherine wants to sing that song. It's a doxology.